Hi, Mrs. Beardwood. This is Nick Scoville, the proud Joseph Beardwood III Endowed Chair of Mathematics. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about the kind of research that this endowed chair is helping to fund, my research in topology. And I know I mentioned in my letter that uh, this past year I worked on two projects that the endowed chair helped me to fund. But I'll, since I've got the slides, I wanted to actually tell you about three different areas of topology that I work in. And the first one is in digital topology or digital images. And so we've seen digital images uh, really every single day of our lives. There's something that's really part of uh, 21st century. And so I'll tell you a little bit about what kinds of mathematics goes into studying these, as well as what topology has to say about them. The next branch of math that I'll tell you about is in topological data analysis, or TDA. And this is a hot, new, exciting research area of topology where people take techniques in topology, which historically is a very pure branch of mathematics, not a whole lot of applications of topology, but they're using techniques in topology to study big data sets and to learn things about data sets in statistics that normally we couldn't have said much about using standard statistical techniques. So I think you'll find that pretty interesting. The last branch of topology that I'll tell you about is that of discrete Morse theory, which admittedly is more of a pure area of mathematics, not a whole lot of applications to it, but there are some ways to understand the questions in it without knowing a whole lot of background. So as I mentioned, these three areas of math are three areas of my main research, which is topology. Digital topology is a type of topology, topological data analysis is a type of topology, and discrete Morse theory is a type of topology as well. And so we'll see how these three areas all are related to one another in the fact that they are topology. At the same time, they're distinct in where they start or what they study. So digital topology is not topological data analysis, digital topology is not discrete Morse theory, and topological data analysis is not discrete Morse theory as well. And so hopefully we'll see how that works. But before we look at any one of those three areas, the first question to think about is, well, what is topology? And so we'll begin by giving kind of a working definition of this, which I would define as topology detects and counts holes and their higher dimensional analogs in objects. And so you think about that and you say, well, it's not entirely clear why I would even want to detect a hole in an object, much less a higher dimensional hole. Uh, hold that question off to the side for now. I first want to just think about what it would mean to even detect or to find a hole in an object. Because when you think about it, a hole, it's, it's kind of a nebulous thing. It's kind of tricky to say exactly what it is. It's defined, well, in terms of what it isn't, the fact that I claim I have a hole in the middle of this picture is really because of all the stuff surrounding the negative space there. So already, it's not entirely clear what we even mean by a hole or how I would detect it. Well, one way to think about this is to notice that in between the hole and the actual object is this kind of circle acting as a boundary, bounding the hole and the object. And that's illustrated there in the red. So in one sense, detecting a hole in an object is equivalent to finding a circle in an object which doesn't bound any part of the object. Okay, well, that's maybe one more positive way of thinking about this. Now, we also want to point out that holes are not perfectly circular. They can be elongated or elliptical or kind of jagged. Um, they can come in many shapes and sizes. But as this hole is changing, so the corresponding circular boundary is also smoothly changing with it. And one idea in topology that we want to make sure to bring across is the idea that I'm going to be much more loose in what I mean by a circle now. I'm going to be much less interested in rigidity. I'm going to be less interested in radius and distance and things like this, but rather I'm going to be looking for an overall kind of relationship that gives me something like a circle. And we'll see that illustrated uh, fairly soon. But for now, I want to move to what I think is a fascinating application of topology, something called the Blue Brain Project which is a current area of research that's going on as we speak. You can Google the Blue Brain Project and read more about it. It's a project that's going on in Switzerland, and there's this 
huge team of researchers, biologists, chemists, neuroscientists, mathematicians, many, many others, a multi-million dollar project, multi-year project, where they are studying a rat brain. And what they've done is they've taken a rat brain and they've essentially mapped this entire rat brain onto a computer in the sense that they have all the neuron information and all the synapse or all the uh, connections between neuron information in this rat brain stored on the computer. So we can see um, a small example of this. The gray dots are the neurons and the lines between the neurons are these synapses. And so this is a huge data set that they're working with. It's something like 31,000 neurons and 37 million synapses, 37 million connections between them. So a very, very large data set. Now, I mentioned that there's mathematicians working on this project, and that shouldn't be too surprising. But what is a little bit surprising is that these mathematicians are not applied mathematicians, at least in the historical sense of the word. Rather, they're topologists. And so we might ask, well, why would the researchers in the Blue Brain Project be interested in having topologists on this project? In order to start to answer that question, let's take a closer look at these neurons and the synapses. So one fact about synapses is that the information shared between neurons tends to be directional in the sense that even though there's a synapse between these pairs of neurons, the communication may only be directional in the sense that the neuron on the left can communicate with the neuron on the right, but not necessarily vice versa. So if there's some information that the neuron on the right would want to communicate with the neuron on the left, it, it can't do that. It's, the information can't flow backwards unless these two neurons are part of a larger system where the information can flow through one or more neurons to get back to the neuron on the left. And we see here a kind of loop structure where the information for the neuron on the right can get to the neuron on the left by going through a second neuron. And so this is kind of a uh, loop structure which neuroscientists are really interested in detecting in the brain because it corresponds to kind of a higher cognitive function. When I find it, when I discover this kind of loop in the brain, I'm seeing um, some highly structured part of the brain. Well, when we think about it, this is really a relational model for a circle. I can think of this as modeling, at least in terms of the relationships, not in terms of distances or radii, modeling the relations that points would have, which give me something like a circle. I'm going to call this circle S1, S standing for sphere, 1 standing for one-dimensional. Even though it looks two-dimensional, which it, it is in one sense, it's one-dimensional in another sense because if I'm an ant standing on this circle, everywhere I look around me, it looks one-dimensional. Globally, it's two-dimensional, but locally, it's one-dimensional. And so this structure, when I detect it in the brain, it's really detecting a circle, or as we said before, a hole. And as we mentioned, topologists are really good at finding these holes. So that's something that topologists can do. But we don't need to stop there at a one-dimensional hole or a one-dimensional circle. Topologists can pretty easily detect two-dimensional holes or two spheres in uh, the brain or any other kind of structure. So this is the minimum number of points that I would need to mathematically model the relationships that would be present in something that has the structure of a two-sphere. And again, I'm going to call this a two-sphere because it is modeling what is happening in a sphere where, even though globally it's three-dimensional, if I'm standing on the sphere, every place I stand looks two-dimensional. And a really nice example of this, of course, is the surface of the Earth. Every place I stand, it looks two-dimensional, but globally it's a three-dimensional object. So topologists can very easily detect these kinds of structures. Well, even though I can't draw one, I can very easily draw the relations that would be present in a three-sphere. A sphere that naturally lives in four dimensions, which I can't see, but locally everywhere looks three-dimensional. And this is the minimum number of points that I would need to create the relationships present for the existence of a three-sphere. And again, topology is really good at detecting these kinds of structures as well. 
And so the idea of using topologists in the Blue Brain project is that if a loop, if a one-dimensional hole corresponds to higher cognitive function in the brain, well then maybe a two or three or four or five or six or a hundred dimensional hole corresponds to something even higher in terms of the cognitive function in the brain. And in fact, the researchers in the Blue Brain Project have found a lot of seven and eight dimensional holes in this rat brain. And if nothing else, it's a place that they can point the neuroscientists to and say, hey, we found some really highly structured mathematical things happening in this area of the brain. Is there something neurologically interesting happening here? So wouldn't that be neat if it turned out that um, something like the ability, the, the, the capacity for language corresponded to a 47 dimensional hole? That'd be very fascinating. We don't know if this is the case or not, but highly structured mathematics may correspond to highly structured uh, cognitive function. So the jury's still out on that question, but I think it's a very promising lead to studying something that we know very little about right now. So that's my general introduction to topology, why someone might be interested in looking at holes. I now want to tell you a little bit about the three branches of topology that I work in. The first being that of digital topology. And so when I think of digital topology, well, before I think of that, I think of digital images. And before I think of digital images, I think of that which make up digital images or pixels. Sorry, the contrast there from the black to the white was very jarring. Um, pixels, though, are something that are all around us, that we see every day in our televisions, hopefully not tube TVs anymore. We see them in our computers and our laptops. We see them in our cell phones. And they're just really in, as I said earlier, um, most things that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis here in the 21st century. So I want to tell you a little bit about pixels and kind of the mathematics that people study when they are looking at digital images. Um, just to give you an idea that for every different way in which you might encounter pixels, there's a different kind of mathematics that's involved in studying them. So the first application of uh, digital topology or digital images that I want to talk about is in the world of graphic design. And here I'm not talking about drawing an image from scratch, but maybe taking an existing image and manipulating it somehow. So a real simple example is suppose I have this blue line, or you can think of it as a vector, or you can think of it as a point. And what I want to do is maybe rotate it along some given angle. Okay, very simple kind of thing that I want to do, but how would I sort of mathematically do that? Or how would I tell a computer to do that? Well, with a little bit of simple linear algebra, I can use a matrix. I can use a matrix with trigonometric functions to uh, rotate that point along that given angle. And if you're you know, not familiar with matrices or you know, uh, trigonometric functions give you PTSD, this might look a little uh, intense, but if you've studied a little bit of linear algebra, this is a very easy thing to do uh, and powerful. And I can not only manipulate by rotation um, digital images, I can scale them, make them larger or smaller, I can translate them and do all kinds of other manipulations like that. Another really interesting kind of manipulation I can do is the following. Let's take this digital image in the bottom, this monkey or uh, baboon looking thing, and maybe to each pixel, let's associate three numbers. And the numbers will correspond to the intensity of red, green, and blue. Essentially, I'm looking at a color rule or a color function. And so what I can do is I can change, I can manipulate those colors through another matrix. Let's apply this matrix. And what this matrix does is it swaps the intensities of the red and the blue in the picture on the left, and the output is the picture on the right. And so that's what you end up getting, kind of a neat thing to manipulate the colors here. And you can imagine it would be very easy to play around with that matrix there, put in some one-halves and zeros and threes, try all kinds of different numbers, and see how the ch colors change. And you can do other really neat things too, like you can start with a color image and maybe slowly fade to grayscale over time with some very basic linear algebra. So math comes up a lot here. Another well, very important application in the world of digital images is digital medical imaging. And here we see slices of the human brain at different heights. And you can kind of ask yourself, well, how did we 
come about obtaining these images. We can't go directly into the brain and take a picture of it. We have to somehow infer what's happening at those various heights. And this is a pretty sensitive question. It's very important that we get this correct because, well, if I see this kind of white phenomenon happening in that picture all the way to the right, I had better be very certain that that corresponds to reality. People's lives are at stake here, depending on how I uh, look at these pictures and interpret them. And so getting these pictures right is important, and a lot of mathematics goes into getting these pictures right. Fourier analysis, for example, comes into obtaining these pictures through information uh, where I can't just look at something and take a picture directly. So another very important application. Finally, the last application I want to talk about is in noise reduction. And here we see a really nice picture of a building, or at least it, it would be a nice picture of a building, but it's kind of all messed up. I've got these horizontal black lines that are screwing up this picture. Maybe through development they, they came up, or maybe the image was corrupted, something like this. But what I would like to do is be able to have a kind of algorithm, kind of rule where I take this image and I put it through this algorithm, and the algorithm checks every pixel and says, well, this pixel is part of the original picture, but this picture's pixel is noise, and I need to get rid of it, and then furthermore interpolate, color in, replace this noisy pixel with something that makes the picture look nice. And you can imagine if we have a good algorithm, I can take this picture, run it through the algorithm, and it will clean this up very nicely, get rid of all that noise, and interpolate to fill in the picture with uh, what ought to be there. And so this is another very important application of digital images, of the mathematics that goes into studying digital images. Well, at this point, I want to turn to digital topology. What would it mean to do topology in this digital setting? So I'd like to maybe come up with a mathematical model of topology in the digital setting. So here's a perfectly valid digital image. It's uh, some pixels that are colored in. It's not a very refined scale. If I wanted this to look a little bit more smooth, I'd make the boxes smaller and smaller, but this will be good for illustrative purposes. So again, I don't want to color in a picture to communicate things to you. I want to be able to say mathematically how to analyze these things. Well, I'm kind of working in a grid space. I can think of uh, points where I have an intersection as kind of lattice points, 3 comma 1, negative 2 comma 7, and so rather than color in a box, I can associate a corresponding point where I've got these kind of crosshairs happening. And so this information gives me the same information that coloring in those, pic those pixels did, except now I can describe them by points in a plane. Okay, so far so good. Well, in addition to points in the plane, I also need to talk about adjacency or neighbors or nearness, which points are close to which other points. Well, again, I'm working in a grid. There's a very natural notion of which points are close to other points. One of them is called for adjacency. And the rule here is that, that if I'm a point that's lit up, I look up, down, left and right, and I see if any one of those points are lit up. And if so, I connect myself to them. And if not, I leave it alone. And when I do that, when I draw a little black line between points that are four adjacent, I get a picture that looks like this. Okay, that looks pretty nice, but this isn't the only option I have for adjacency. Not only can I look up, down, left, and right, but I can also look to my diagonals as well. And so that gives me four more options. So this is called eight adjacency because any point can have at most eight different neighbors, up, down, left, right, and then my four diagonals. And when I draw the eight adjacency relations, I get a picture that looks like this. And that allows us to maybe uh, thicken the, the corners. Okay, well, if you're thinking back to the Blue Brain Project, you can see that this is a kind of model that looks very similar to those spheres that we were looking at before. So we're squarely in the realm of topology. But now the question is, well, which notion of adjacency is better? I have a, a definition of what I mean by a topological digital image. It can be a subset of the integer lattice, but I have a, a couple of options. I have choices. Do I want to think of my notion of nearness as four adjacency or as eight adjacency? Well, to think about this question, let's think about how topology works in the standard setting, in the kind of smooth, normal setting. And what I'm thinking of here is a very foundational fundamental result in topology called the Jordan Curve Theorem, 
which you may not know by name, but I guarantee you know it by its content, by what it says. So let me illustrate this Jordan curve theorem for you. So the Jordan curve theorem says the following. Any simple closed curve in the plane will always separate the plane into exactly two pieces, namely an interior and an exterior. So what do I mean by that? I take a simple closed curve. Simple meaning I'm not allowed to intersect myself, right? so I can't draw over a place I've already drawn. And closed meaning I begin and end at the same point. And so here we see four illustrations of simple closed curves. And the Jordan curve theorem says that if you do this, I guarantee that you will always break the plane up into two pieces, an interior, which is given in the blue, and an exterior, which is given in the orange. And so here are four illustrations of this. So when you think about that, you say, well, yeah, that's completely obvious. What else could it possibly be? Well, it actually took mathematicians a really long time to prove this. It was very difficult to think about what assumptions to start with and how to define certain things. And this is a very celebrated result. There were actually many false proofs of this in, in the past where people made very subtle errors. So this is, as I said, a foundational result in topology. And I would really like this result to work in the digital setting. Do we have a digital analog of this in our digital world? And it may depend on our notion of adjacency, whether or not we use four or eight adjacency. So let's try and investigate this question. Here is a very nice Jordan 4 curve. And by that, I mean I'm going to take a collection of points, I'm going to take a simple closed curve, and my notion of adjacency is for adjacency. I'm not going to draw any lines between points that are away from each other on a diagonal. So now what I want to do is I want to take the complement of this. I want to draw, color in, every lattice point in red that isn't there in the gray, and then make all possible four adjacencies among those red points. So here we go. Let's color in all those points there red and make all possible four adjacencies among the red points. And we notice that this breaks the plane up into not two separate red pieces, but three separate red pieces. We have a nice exterior, but inside the curve, I have two separated points. And they're separated by an eight adjacency. And so the Jordan curve theorem here fails if I'm using four adjacency, if that's my notion of nearness. So that's a little bit disappointing. Well, let's try with eight adjacency. Maybe that'll work. Let's take a Jordan eight curve. And again, here I mean I'm going to draw a simple closed curve where I use eight adjacency. Now I'm allowed to make connections between points that are diagonal from each other. I'll take the complement, draw every point that isn't on that curve in red, and make all possible eight adjacencies among those points, and once again, I run into a problem. Here, I'm not breaking the plane up into three or four components. Rather, it's only a single component. Uh, these points on the inside of the curve, well, there, there is no inside or outside of the curve. There's these red uh, diagonals that sneak past this curve, that jump right over it. And so the complement of this curve is a single piece, not two pieces. So this situation looks pretty bleak. It looks like we don't have this foundational, fundamental result in digital topology. Well, actually, not all is lost. It turns out that in this case, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. And this is a result due to Rosenfeld from the 1970s, and he proved a digital version of the Jordan curve theorem. How does he get around this problem that we saw illustrate, illustrated? Well, what Rosenfeld says is, if you are working with a digital Jordan curve, don't take, and you're, work, and you're working with a four curve, don't take the four complement, take the eight complement. And similarly, if you're working with a Jordan eight curve, don't take the eight complement, take the four complement. Have the two notions kind of interact with each other. And in this way, Rosenfeld claims, you will always break the plane up into exactly two disconnected pieces. Okay, so let's illustrate Rosenfeld's result on those two previous examples that we saw. Here I have that Jordan 4 curve, and we saw that if we take the 4 complement, we break the plane up into three pieces, so that doesn't quite work. But Rosenfeld says don't break the plane up into three pieces, don't take the 4 complement, take the 8 complement. And when I do that, ah, now I notice that those two previously disconnected pieces are now connected up. 
by this eight adjacency. Okay, so that's a nice illustration of Rosenfeld's result for uh, a four curve. Let's take the Jordan eight curve, that diamond. And again, I don't want to take the eight complement. I want to take the four complement, have the four and eight interact with each other. And in this way, I don't have these eight adjacencies sneaking past the boundary anymore. I've got the plane broken up into exactly two pieces. And so I think this is a nice illustration of the kinds of ways you need to think and the kinds of questions that come up in digital topology. So that's what I wanted to say about digital topology, kind of introduction to that subject. Next, I want to turn to this other branch of topology that I work in, uh, topological data analysis, or TDA. And as I mentioned in my letter, I worked on a project on TDA in, uh, in March, or sorry, it was May, at Ohio State University. So our beginning question for topological data analysis is very different than where we start with digital topology. Let's suppose I have a collection of points that are sampled from some unknown object. I don't know what this object is, but I can sample points from it. Maybe it's a physical object. Maybe it's a, a set of um, points that are sampled from a population. Maybe it's some statistics. I, I want to learn a population parameter, and so I take a sampling of points from some population, and I can plot them in the plane, and I get something that looks like this. And so if you look at that, your mind's eye want us, wants to say, well, these points are coming from some sort of object, underlying object like there in the red, a kind of thickened ellipse with a bar in the middle. Well, how would I mathematically try to argue that this is where these points are coming from? Well, one thing I could try to do is I could say, okay, well, let's, let's approximate what this underlying object might be by taking a disk of a fixed radius around each point. And what I'll do is if two disks intersect with one another, I'll draw a line between their corresponding points. I will get rid of those disks. And now what I'm left with is an approximation of the underlying object. So at first, that seems like a pretty nice idea, except that, well, first of all, this is probably not a very good approximation if for no other reason than the approximation depends very heavily on my choice of radius of the disk. I got that approximation because I chose this radius. And this is a really sensitive question because if I choose a radius that's too small, I will get no connections. And in the other extreme, if I choose a radius that's way too large, I'm going to get everything connected to everything else. So I have to choose the radius very carefully. Well, the way that topological data analysis goes about choosing a radius is by taking them all at once and seeing how, as the radius changes, how the object that the radius is building changes as well, taking down, writing down information as it's changing. So let me start to illustrate this to you. It's much easier seen in a picture than in words. I'm going to start with a radius of zero. And I'm going to let that slowly grow. And as I have intersections, I'm going to start to draw lines. Draw a line, draw a line, draw a line. I'm going to pause right here, actually. And what I said was that I want to keep track of information that is changing as I start to make these connections. So to tell you what kind of information I want to keep track of, I'm going to zoom in on one of the parts here, on this piece right there, to uh, try and illustrate this. So in this picture now, in this zoomed in picture, I have one, two, three, four, five separate pieces, five different components. And those are represented in the top left hand corner by those five dark blue dots. And what I'm going to do is that as I let the radius grow, starting at radius zero, I'm going to have a bar emanating out of each one of those dark blue dots as the radius continues to grow, so will the bar continue to grow. Now, as two uh, disks intersect, I'm going to cut off the bar. I'm going to cap it off. And in this way, I'm going to get what's called a barcode or a summary of the information that I'm seeing as it changes. So let me illustrate this to you. I'm going to let the radius of these disks grow, and these bars are also going. As I get an intersection, cut off the bar, cut it off, cut it off, pause. What I want to point out right here is that I have one, two separate pieces. I've got these four dots that are connected with one another. That's one piece. And then I've got the dot at the top still all by itself. 
And that's illustrated in the five dark blue bars by the fact that there's only two of those bars, namely the bottom two, that have not been capped off. And so this upper, this top, um, this barcode there in the top left-hand corner is, as I said, summarizing how the number of pieces is changing over time. And sort of the shorter the bar is, the less real that feature is, and the longer the bar is, the more real that feature is. And so that's what I'm going to keep track of in blue, the number of components or separate pieces, uh, how they are changing and how they're being connected up to one another. At the same time, I not only want to keep track of the number of pieces that I'm looking at, I want to keep track of the number of holes that I'm seeing. And so we're going to see right now, in red, a hole born as these disks begin to grow. So I fill that in, pause. Notice right now that I have a hole right there in the middle. I've got these four disks that, are, that uh, any two of them are kind of touching with one another other than the one at the uh, bottom left-hand corner and the top right corner. They're not touching one another. And so that has detected a little gap there, a hole. And so we have in the top left-hand corner this red dot that was born, that indicates the birth or the existence of that hole. And so I'm going to want to keep track of that piece of information as well. And so I'm going to continue with these disks growing, and we'll see that as these disks grow, they will very quickly fill in that hole, and we'll see a little bar emanating from the red dot in the left top left-hand corner as those uh, disks grow. And it'll be very brief, it lasted a very short amount of time, and then I capped this off. And so in the top left-hand corner, we see a very short red bar, which means that a hole was born and died very, very quickly. And by the way, this really is the technical language that topological data analysis analysts use. They use this language of birth and death. Um, kind of morbid, but, but it sort of gets the job done. So I'm going to want to do all of this now at once. In blue, keep track of the number of pieces that are born and then are cut off. And then in red, keep track of the number of holes that are born and cut off. And as this is all happening, the length of the bar is going to help me to determine how real that feature is. So we've got all these different pieces. And as these disks get connected up, these bars, blue bars, get cut off. Now I've got these two holes there in the middle. And I've got these two red bars at the bottom going, still going, still going, still going. Now they've been cut off. And at this point, we have gone from disks of radius 0 to radius you know, 100, a million, whatever it takes to get everything connected to everything else. And at the bottom, we have this nice data summary of what we just witnessed. We saw all these components. They were born. They began, really, at, time, at the beginning of the time. And they eventually were all cut off. We saw two holes being born illustrated by the two long red lines, and they lasted for quite a while. Uh, on the other hand, there's this very tiny red bar that was born and quickly died. That's telling me that that probably is not a real feature of that data, whereas the two long red bars tell me that that is a real feature of the data. Now, just like in statistics, where I can have a pie chart or a bar graph, I can have multiple ways to communicate the same piece of information to you, so I can do this in topological data analysis. I've got a barcode at the bottom of the screen. I can change that barcode into something called a persistence diagram, which is the exact same information, but being communicated from a different picture. In this case, the x-axis is the birth time, and the y-axis is the death time. And we see right along the y-axis, all these blue dots, well, that's because they were all there, they were all born at time zero, but they eventually died at these various heights. The red dots we also see. We see the one red dot very close to the diagonal. That's the one that was born and then almost immediately died. But then we see these two red dots that are far above the diagonal, which corresponds to the fact that they were born, and they lasted a good while before they died, again, giving me sort of a visual representation of the fact that those are probably real features of the data. Now, you can imagine that this was a persistence diagram that I got from one sampling of data. What if I took a second sampling of data? 
I would probably get a very different looking persistence diagram. And so the question is, how do I compare these two? Because maybe I don't know what the object on the left is, but maybe I do know what the object on the right is. It's a kind of a test case. So the data on the left is from some unknown object. The data on the right is from some object that I know what it is. And in fact, I think, as a researcher, I think that the object on the right is the same as the object on the left. Well, I'm gonna get two different persistence diagrams, two different summaries of the data, I would expect that. But the question is, how close are they? Are they really probably coming from the same thing? Would I expect this kind of variation in their persistence diagrams? I see on the right, I have pretty much two um, holes that were born and that lasted for a while. I've got some noise along the diagonal. Are these coming from the same object? Well, a really nice way to think about answering this question is something called the bottleneck distance, a distance between these two persistence diagrams. It's a number that I associate to these two diagrams, which tells me how different they are. And so if I have the exact same diagram, I get a number, I get the, a value of zero. And if I get two diagrams that are pretty close to one another, I probably get a very small number. And so this number is meant to represent how different the diagrams are and how close the underlying data are to one another. And so this is, as you can probably imagine at this point, a very complicated object. Uh, it takes a lot of computing power. And so a lot of people are interested in analyzing this and studying this and thinking about how we can estimate this value. And that is something that I also like to think about in topological data analysis. So finally, this last branch of uh, topology that I want to tell you about is discrete Morse theory. And as I said, this is a little bit more pure area of mathematics, not a whole lot of applications. But here's one um, kind of way to think about questions in discrete Morse theory that I think uh, makes, makes some sense. So let's think about a game you might play on an iPad or on your iPhone. Now, we were talking about digital images before, and this is, uh, you know, you'd see digital images, but this might be something that you'd play, a game you'd play on your iPad to kill five minutes or something like that. You're kind of bored. Um, and here's the way the game works. You start the game up, and it gives you a picture that looks like this. There's these rows of dots, and there's some lines in between rows of dots. And there could be lots of rows, um, there could be lots of lines, but who knows? The, the lines, though, are always in between consecutive rows. And the object of the game is this. Uh, since it's an iPad, you can touch the screen. So I'm going to touch one of the lines. So I'll touch a line, I'll kind of light up the line, and when I do that, I light up the corresponding dots, the corresponding points that it's touching. And the object of this game is to light up the correct configuration of lines so that every dot is covered, is lit up, once and exactly once. Okay, so this is obviously not going to be a, a bestseller, uh, but you get the idea of the game. Very simple kind of thing. So let's try to play this game. I lit up the one line there on the left. Let me touch more lines to light up points, and hopefully I'll light up every point once and exactly once. So I'll light up these two points by touching that red line there. Okay, and let's see. Maybe let me light up that one. Okay, that's looking pretty good. Uh, I better get the stuff at the top. So let me light up the points at the top, and let's see, what have I, have I not lit up yet? Oh, so now I'm kind of in trouble, because how am I going to light up those two points? Um, any line coming out of those two points already has the other point lit up. So if I touch any one of those lines, I'm going to light up a point twice. I'm in trouble. I've lost. I lost this game. That was a pretty foolish strategy on my part. So let's go backwards a few steps before the point of no return. And actually, if I think about it, I really should have had a better strategy because any point that has only one line coming out of it, that's the only game in town. That's the only one I can light up. So let me try this again. Let me light up that one right away because there's only one line I can touch to light up the point. Let me do the top one as well. That The point there in the middle, um, there's only one line that'll light that up. Touch that. And oh, cool. Now I touch that one there and those two points are lit up as well. I won. Yay. You know, again, uh, not a bestseller, but we get the idea. Okay. Well, let's look at another variation of this game or another, uh, another setup. And maybe I start the game up and I get a picture that looks like this. 
And now I look at this picture and upon some, some, some reflection, I realize that I'm going to be in trouble no matter what I do, because no matter what line I touch or light up, I will always have two points that aren't lit up. And so when I think about it, this is actually a fault of the person who designed this game. Uh, we've seen this before maybe in Sudoku. You know, you have to come up with the right configuration of a Sudoku puzzle, um, and there are some configurations of Sudoku puzzles that are impossible to solve, and so someone has to check and make sure that they're giving you a problem that's actually solvable. In this case, it's not. But whenever I have something that isn't solvable, this raises an interesting question for mathematics. Uh, namely, what's the second bet, or what's the best I can do? I can't do this perfectly, what's the best I can do? So points that aren't lit up, I'm going to call critical. So I'll say a point that can't be covered or lit up is critical, and then the question, or at least a variation of one of the questions that we like to study in discrete Morse theory is, well, what's the minimum number of critical points for any given picture? So ideally, if I'm playing this game on an iPad or something, it's always zero. I can always find some covering where there's no critical points left over. But in general, for example, that picture we saw one slide ago, um, the minimum number is two. And so given a more complicated one, I want to study what's the fewest number of po critical points left over. And this becomes a really interesting uh, mathematical question and uh, things like this. So this is my very brief introduction to discrete Morse theory. Um, there, there's, this is sort of the idea behind it. And this is really the kinds of topology that I work in. So I want to um, thank you for making it to this point, and thank you, Mrs. Beardwood, so much um, for the opportunity to, uh, to hold the Beardwood chair. It, it really is a tremendous honor, and um, I hope uh, you see that it's, it's helping to, to fund some uh, interesting research. And um, I thank you very much for that.